said that i don't know it is scriptured in our mythology uh, so that is why we have to follow this okay i said okay fine and then when uh, like it was my own wedding it was my own wedding then uh, like i saw that my grandmother was not allowed to per participate in any of the rituals why because she was a widow and uh, in hinduism widows are not allowed in any any uh, any holy function widows are not allowed to participate in any holy function moreover pregnant women are not allowed to participate in any holy function okay if, if if you leave all these we have two epics in hinduism we have two epics one is the ramayana and the other one is mahabharata if you read both you'll find that you woman has uh, woman had have been treated horribly in uh, in ramayana what we find is that sita being the uh, wife of rama she she has to go through a lot initially in her life and her pregnant her pregnancy leads her to her husband leaving her that was ridiculous and in mahabharata we can find draupadi who was forced to have five husbands by her mother in law if you don't believe me you can refer to these epics you can uh, you can you can read them and you can refer to these epics it was horrible and also in modern times we women are not allowed to uh, enter any temple when we are on our periods or when we are pregnant this is horrible so hinduism treats women horribly so all these things led led me to like leave my religion and leave a, a live an atheist life so this is my story thank you so much rita that is I've noticed a lot and I've, um, you know, when you read epics and you read biblical, uh, you know, literature, you read the Quran, you see all of these stories that are like raise your eyebrows. Like, why did I, why is this even here? What does this actually help us with? Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, Rif, we lost Rivka for a little bit. Um, when we were talking to, with Veiled Rose, I mentioned how, you know, when I was, when I left Islam, the first religion I looked into each day is I'm thinking like, oh, oh, gee, maybe Islam, you know, just made it worse about, you know, how would they treat women? And, um, so I started reading a little bit more about Judaism and found out that is not true. Um, so would you like to talk a little bit more about your journey, Rivka? Yes. Sorry about the, uh, uh, blackout for a moment there. Um, yeah, so for me, as I said earlier, I don't ever remember believing, even as a child, but I did, you know, participate. I grew up in um, a believing family. My mother, much more religious than my father, um, but we followed all the rituals and practices. But as a kid, and even as an adult, um, I, especially as a child, understood that my impression of Judaism was not necessarily that you needed to believe, but you need to follow the 613 commandments, which are part of the law. So similar to Islam, these are rules about every aspect of your life. You know, um, what foods you can eat, what foods you can't eat, how long you have to wait between eating milk and dairy or vice versa, what shoe you put on first. Um, you know, uh, very some very religious Jewish women will cover their hair, some even shave their head and wear wigs. All of these are these rules that um, are part of these commandments, not wearing mixed fabrics. There's so many of them. And as a kid, what I saw was these commandments were basically work for women. That is how I viewed Judaism. It was the woman's job to do the work 
and to obey. And the men would go to synagogue or, you know, men would go to temple. And that was important because they're studying and they're talking amongst themselves. But women's worship, so to speak, in my impression of it as a kid, was the work. And it's a lot of it. If everything leads up to Friday and you're not using electricity or driving or cooking with your stove, all of these rules, that's a lot of preparation. And that goes from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. You've, you've got to do all the work for it. And so that was part of why I rejected it, because I didn't see how it benefited me. Also, it seems ridiculous. And as Rada pointed out, the uh, Old Testament is horrendous in terms of its, um, not just its view of women, but the, the death and destruction and murder and jealousy and war that God inflicts upon not just his chosen people, but the entire earth. And I always found it very kind of gross and uncomfortable. We would, um, my parents had a big illustrated Bible and my mother would read these stories to me at night and they were not nice, not comforting, not any of that. Um, but I wanted to make a, a comment with regard to something that Rita said about the uncleanness of women when they're menstruating in Hinduism as, you know, not allowed to go into a temple or things like that. Judaism has that. And if you are a very religious Jew, you are not allowed to touch your husband when you are menstruating, which means you can't hug him. You can't hand him something and accidentally bump his hand. You can't, you know, pat him on the arm. Um, often, and my grandmother had this her whole life. It was two twin beds that they would push together. And then when she was menstruating or a lot of times, they would just pull them apart. So they're sleeping in separate beds. And then you're considered unclean until you have no blood for at least three days. And then you have to go to a ritual bath and cleanse yourself of the impurity of who you are. That reminds and, me of um, Islam. Islam has very similar rules when it comes to menstruation. You can't yeah, go into we, a mosque, you can't touch the Quran, you can't mm -hmm. pray or fast, you have to go through the ritual bath in order to clean yourself. Yeah, Islam and Judaism, and I think this bears saying just for people who may not know it, are so much more, so much similar to each other, more so than Judaism or Christianity or Islam and Christianity. I agree. We, you know, a lot of rules about how you live your life and it's all encompassing. And that was part of why I, I, I found it so oppressive. And also similar to Lee as Islam, people are watching you and how you behave or the rules that you follow. Or, you know, I remember we moved a lot. My father worked for the government and m my mother became less stringent in her practice because she didn't have the community. She, you know, we were moving constantly. It's really difficult to have a kosher kitchen and keep all the, you know, separate pots and pans and separate everything. And you couldn't get the things then, you know, that you can now on the internet. But what she told me was, and this is a direct quote, no one is watching me anymore. Because once you're away from that community, no one's watching you. So um, I have a lot more to say, but let's, you know, let somebody else talk. Thank you, Rivka. I completely understand. It's, um, it's. It's a lot, yes. Um, Ali, um, you mentioned that you were ex-Jehovah's Witness. We all know that ex-Jehovah's Witness is, a, as you mentioned, like an organization that uses religion. It is religious, but uh, they're more of an organization than they are like a church. Um, but how would you describe your journey from leaving Jehovah's Witness? Um, so it's 
I always found it very strange. So when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I was told and believed that it was the one true religion and that all other religions were false. And I thought that because all other religions were false, they'd be very different. And I just find it amazing since I've left listening to other people speak, um, listening to ex-Muslims, listening to Jewish people who don't adhere to the faith anymore. The stories are so similar, the idea of having all these rules and the idea of watching, of people watching. So my kind of experience of Christianity from the outside at looking at other Christian denominations, you know, my granny went to church, she was in the Church of Scotland, that to her was like a kind of social network and she had friends and she went on a Sunday and she didn't really need to believe. Whereas when I was a Jehovah's Witness, it's a very close community and it's the same thing that elders are watching you, people are watching all the time. And you have, they have what's called their core set of beliefs, but they have principles around those beliefs. Those principles kind of change all the time. In fact, the beliefs change as well. They're subject to what's called new light. So if God changes his mind on something, we'll get new light. <laughs> suddenly it would be you you were allowed to do something you couldn't do before or you didn't have to do something that had been a huge part of your life I never even thought to question like do I really believe something if my beliefs can be changed just like that overnight um so it's incredible to hear all these different stories and to kind of just realize those kind of very culty aspects that creep into religion or creep into organizations but my journey to leaving wasn't that straightforward I'd been quite devout. I am you're isolated as well. So my whole social system, everything was based around being a Jehovah's Witness. That's so kind of like you get told you're a Jehovah's Witness and that's your identity. You're not a person. I wasn't a person. You're not allowed to, you're not supposed to go to university, the certain books you're not supposed to read, this films you're not supposed to watch. So your kind of cultural understanding is really limited as well. So I kind of felt that I couldn't leave because I didn't know anyone outside. Um, I was in a very kind of strict marriage as well, so that made it difficult. And you're not supposed to um, mix with people from work either. So it's just that like real isolation. Um, and I kind of thought about leaving when I was in my teens and I knew I would lose my mother. I didn't want to lose my mom. So I stayed a witness. And then I had my first daughter when I was 25. Um, and like Rivka says, the Old Testament is really horrible. It's such a grim book. It's full of all these awful stories. And I was given um, what's called a book of Bible stories. It was like you're supposed to read them to the children. And I had nightmares from it when I was little. And then suddenly I was supposed to read it to my daughter. And I just thought, I can't do that. And again, I thought there was something wrong with me that I didn't want to, that I couldn't read it to her. It just kind of made me feel sick. So that was really the beginning of the end. And then it took about two years before I got brave enough um, to leave, basically. Those biblical stories are really, <clears throat> I wonder what was going through our parents' minds reading those stories to us as a young child, because those were my bedtime stories. It was like, oh, you know, when Moses, when Moses was born, he was put in a box and thrown in the river. Like, yeah, everybody wants to hear that story. That sounds like a great story. <laughs> it's a very it's it's more in my opinion and you and I would like to know all of your insights as well because it seems to be that um scripture is for us the main reason we left and a lot of people would say like oh no you just wanted to leave because you wanted you know earthly things or you wanted to um, have fun in this life but it seems that in, in each case with us, what if we, whether it's Islam, Hinduism, um, Christianity or Judaism, it's like, no, it's the actual scripture. Um, I wanted to ask a question before moving on to um, open discussion. Um, and it's why, why did you choose to speak today or in general? I know Veiled Rose, you've been, um, you know, an ex-Muslim for a long time and recently you have become open and we are extremely grateful today to have you here. Um, can you let us know what it is about, what, what, what pushed you to be able to be, to become vocal about this? 
Hi there. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm really chuffed to be invited onto the panel. Um, so firstly, thank you for having me here. Um, so what pushed me to be here? Um, so basically, for those who aren't aware of my story or how I came to come along here, I've been an ex-Muslim since I was 15. I'm 41 now, so for for most of that time, until about 2007, ex-Muslim wasn't really a term that was used at all, uh, and it wasn't in the dictionary, um, and I, I believe ex-religious people wasn't a thing either, so atheism's only become fashionable, or not fashionable, but a, a, a recognised movement and, and identity more recently. Um, so yeah so i've been an atheist since i was about 15 um but i was questioning religion since i was six seven years old because of all these horrendous rituals and rules like rivka and ali have mentioned and rita as well um which always hit me really hard um, and I remember even as a young child I felt so suffocated from these religious rules and and what have you and I I remember one of the first things that kick-started my ex-Muslim activism was the conversation I had with my niece and so I shared a video that Sheriff Gaber, a ex-Muslim from Egypt, had done and he was talking about, sorry, just a, a second. Um, so, yeah, so in his video he was talking and encouraging women in the Muslim, in the Middle Eastern world to reject the misogyny that they were facing and saying that there is a better way to live and be if you go to europe and america and places like that women aren't treated like cattle or something to be got you know to be hidden away and uh, women have the rights to divorce if they want to they don't have to put up with their marital grape and domestic violence and things like that and my niece um she just hated the video and she accused me of being a racist for sharing it and she, she was busy pointing out the racism in the video and saying that women in the west have it really bad as well and her attitude and was so it literally made me feel heartbroken and like I wanted to I, d I, I can't I can't describe it fully but it wasn't great and at, this was at the time of the BLM protests and she was very much into the BLM protests and social justice and things like that and I was thinking there's such a huge disconnect here um, and between her social consciousness when it comes to anti-black racism but she's all it just didn't make any sense and it was really frustrating and at that time i really didn't know that much about islam all i knew is that i rejected it because just the basic idea of god didn't make any sense to me and i hated the patriarchy and the abuse that I saw and I didn't want anything to do with the religion or the religious community but it, for me it wasn't that deep and um, for most of my atheist life it wasn't that deep I didn't look into the scriptures or anything like that and I didn't know there was a ex-Muslim community out there until about 2012 2013 when my younger brother mentioned it to me so um yeah it just yeah it just um I, th I think one of the main reasons why i'm here as well is to show people that you can get away from that control and that prison of religion and religious community uh, and you can be free and i've done it i i remember being absolutely petrified when i first 
left home um i you know even though i was living in the uk there there is a lot of horror stories about women being honor killed um in the uk and in australia and places like that and um sorry trying not to get emotional and cry it's really hard um so yeah i just remember those sorts of stories and it it, it i felt like absolute hell and torture inside myself because it felt like you know whenever i see someone else struggling like that or being beaten or you know it feels like i've had that happen to me as well or somebody you know in my immediate circle has had that happen to them and it really it's just debilitating in the way it makes you feel crushed and so i've it took me a good few years to leave my parents home and it was agonizing and it was painful um and it took so much out of me and the first sort of like i remember the first six months of leaving my parents home and i was absolutely petrified um i was constantly looking around my shoulders and make you know and i really didn't think i'd survive I really did think I would go the way of the other women who had been honour killed and stuff like that. Um, so, um, yeah, the, there was that terror. But 25 years later, um, I, well, yeah, I won't get stuck on the details of the years and stuff. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so tw so it, I've been with my, because I've been with my girlfriend for 20 years now. Um, and, you know, uh, we've been in a relationship for that long and we've been really happy. Um, and I just want people to fight for that happiness as well and not give up. Um, I think and that's why i like to share my story and showing my face is absolutely petrifying on so many levels um partly because you know there's the girly issues of does my face look all right does my nose look big but also the uh, and am i wearing the right sort of um, makeup and things like that but that there's the other more serious issue of exposing yourself to the world as an ex-muslim um because of things like things that happen to ex-muslims in our sphere so people like salman rushdie who was sadly you know and barbarically attacked and things like that um but i think i think um one of the reasons why the turning point where i decided that i was definitely going to show my face on social media was when i because i i um, try and help out uh, faithless hijabi with their social media um presence and i was looking and doing a post for them for to support and stop the execution of Iranian, a couple of Iranian um, protesters who were on death row. And I, sorry, <laughs> um, I remember sort of like, I remember one day I was preparing and helping prepare some, you know, like social media posts to encourage people to stop, help stop the executions and stuff. And then I remember a day later, and they'd been executed and to me that was that was it that was like they can go to hell you know these extremists and these you know these complete and utter a-holes can go to hell i'm gonna raise my voice and be shown and i'm not going to be silenced um so that was the real turning point for me um when I decided you know, I was going to have to do this. You know something, Bail Rose, one of the things I keep telling myself is like, I did not leave Saudi Arabia to be uh, silent in America. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, and I think um, one of the other things is I know a lot of us religious women, especially, we are in a minority in the 
ex-religious community still in terms of people who are active um, and, and got a presence on social media and I think that was one of my other motivations for coming on here and showing my face and being vocal um, for because I, I do do a lot of my social media presence on TikTok. Um, I'm a bit disorganized, so, you know, um, uh, but I, the women I've met on there are absolutely mind blowing. The friends I've made on there amongst the ex-Muslim women is absolutely amazing. Um, and I really do hope that they share their stories and come out vocally like this, but they work their socks off on their app, uh, raising ex-Muslim um, issues and sharing the scriptures that are like absolutely vile. And, you know, um, they've been such a great support to me as well um but at the moment a lot of them are hiding their face there which is absolutely fine because everybody's got to go at their own pace um but I, I think I kind of want to do it for them as well because I'm so bloody proud of them uh, it's nice to um show them that you know one day bit by bit hopefully they will you know encourage them to do it as well um but I'm going to let somebody else speak, but I'm going to just share one story first and then I'll let somebody else speak, if that's OK. Um, so um, some of the one of the examples I want to give of the ex-Muslim, uh, an ex-Muslim lady who's on TikTok and who works her socks off raising the issues that we're raising here. Um, I don't know her um, actual name, which is absolutely fine. I always say to people, don't share your information because you want to keep yourself safe first and foremost. Um, but she's a psychiatric nurse and um, she, during her work as a psychiatric nurse, sometimes she gets um, patients who have been told by mullahs and imams that they're going to go to hell if they don't like go to mosque and things like that and give them threats like the religious threats like that and all sorts of controlling threats and she rings the police and gets the police involved and um i just think that's friggin brilliant um that you know there are people out there doing those sorts of actions and looking out for each other um and she's such a hard ass i love it um she you know she doesn't take crap from anyone um and because i can imagine she probably gets a bit of backlash from her local community and that um but she still does it anyway and uh, yeah i just wanted to share that there are a lot of us ex-religious and, and ex-Muslim women out there campaigning and doing things in the background that we don't necessarily acknowledge or notice because we're not showing our faces and stuff. But there are so many of us coming forward. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Belle Rose. Um, uh, Rita, would Thank you like you. to talk a little bit more about your activism? Okay, uh, so the reason why I chose to be uh, in this live show was that, uh, now uh, let's be honest, even uh, even one month ago, I wasn't sure that I'm going to be a part of this because I was really scared. I was, let me, let me be very honest, uh, it's not, even in india i mean india being a uh, being a secular country it's not safe for an ex hindu showing her uh, and that too for a woman like me showing her face so i wasn't very sure of being in this show but when i saw uh, ladies like you gada and uh, uh, vale rose that they are showing their you you guys are showing your face and you guys are sharing your stories I got some confidence that, okay, I also need to come to this show and I need to share my journey and I need to tell me, let people know that why I left my religion. And also I wanted to encourage other Hindu women who are in a dilemma because of these disgusting rituals and who because of these uh, disgusting scriptures who are in a dilemma 
that what to do and what not to do i wanted to uh, like encourage them to leave their uh, i i wanted to just tell them that it is okay to leave your religion and it is okay to live uh, live your life the way you want to it is okay it is okay you need you don't you don't have to get scared of anyone it is your life and it 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 is it is you who should be deciding what to do do not let your religion ruin your life the, the, and this journey started with as i told you this the, uh, like uh, th this journey of rationalism started with my cousin's wedding uh, in the year i think uh, 2008 or 2009 i don't remember exactly but uh, it it is close to 2009 uh, like 2009 beginning of 2009 or the year ending of 2008 i'm not uh, sure so i just want to tell every every uh, ex every hindu woman that it is okay if you want to continue with religion it is it, it is okay it is your life and if you want to discontinue with it, your religion like me if you want to live a rational life it is still okay you don't have to get scared of anyone so that is the reason i am here today and you 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 uh, you brave woman are the reason who who gave me ca uh, confidence to be here you woman uh, cheers to cheers to you woman <laughs> cheers Thank to you. everyone cheers to veil veil rose cheers to gada cheers to rifka you guys are the reason i have been able to talk confidently you guys are the reason <laughs> thank you very much no <laughs> it's very true by the way everybody you know if it doesn't matter what religion you are it doesn't matter what it is if something makes you feel uncomfortable then that's totally fine that means that it just makes you feel uncomfortable and you don't have to believe in it or do it and also i mean uh, these ritual these rituals are meant to be uncomfortable because if you if if you ever come to india and if you see the marriage rituals you will laugh you will simply laugh at them uh, i've on, been to a hindu wedding day, i know <laughs> on the actually yeah on the marriage day and we many uh, the bride and the groom they they have to keep fasting they cannot eat a single thing on on their marriage day until the marriage is done Do, don't you think it is it, it it is absolutely ridiculous i mean all these ridiculous rituals are the reason why i left my religion mm -hmm. and i kept questioning and and and, and i kept questioning uh, all these rituals and that created a problem in my uh, like uh, family life that probably that is the reason i'm staying alone i am sorry yeah. You, uh, yeah it's it really uh, um makes me furious and really sad how easy the hindu apologists have it online it is ridiculous um so uh because there are i've come across ex hindus who have been beaten and threatened and you know um by the police for their ex hindu atheist activism um and when i when i was speaking to an ex hindu and they were telling me about that i was really shocked and i was furious at that you know the stories the aren't coming out actually that is the reason i wasn't confident enough about like coming to the show but then these brave women encouraged me and i thought that i should really stay, share my story and i should really encourage other hindu women to leave their religion yeah and it's it's, it's something we yes. hear all the time is like why are you talking about this religion you know it's uh, it's Uh, you know it's it's known to be more troublesome to criticize like islam hinduism even judaism uh rifka what do you uh talk to us a little bit more about your activism 
so um a few a few things I, I i really do want to um acknowledge the courage that it takes for some women to be able to say that they don't believe to question these things because um granted it's not the case across the board in judaism if you're talking about very, you know, fundamentalist sex, but en general, it's not an issue the same way that it tends to be in a Muslim society or a Hindu society, or even like what Ali was talking about with Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, being isolated from the rest of society and makes you feel like if you leave, uh, you know, there's um, there's a lot of fear there because it's not always necessary to believe in Judaism. It's to follow the rules. And you find that particularly in the United States, a large, very large percent of people who call themselves Jews who attend um rituals and practices or synagogues do not believe in God. Uh, you know, there have been lots of polls, you know, uh, Judaism online did a poll, um, it, you know, that said 52% of American Jews don't believe in the God of the Bible. Uh, 2000, 2013 Pew Research poll, you know, found 62% of American Jews don't think that, you know, um, that Judaism is about ancestry and 66% don't believe it's necessary to believe in God. So we, and this isn't the case, like I said, everywhere, but um, for me, it was easier um, within the larger sphere of Judaism. And also because there's such a cultural aspect to it and ethnic aspect to it, as well as the religious aspect. So it was easier for me to be a non-believer. That said, um, why did I want to come on this show? Why do I speak out on it? Especially if you're in a situation where there isn't necessarily as much fear for physical violence or whatever, you know, what, why, why would you do it? So one of the things that's really important to me is this assumption of religious privilege that so many religions have that somehow being a believer gives you some sort of special privilege or makes you some sort of a better person than someone who isn't. And I feel like it's really, really important to knock down that narrative that, you know, having a belief system or an ideology you know, whether it's, you know, Hinduism or Jehovah's Witness or Islam or Buddhism or whatever, it doesn't give you any more privilege as a human being than I have or any more rights than anyone else has. And that's really, really important to me. Um, and also to fight religious sanctioned bigotry, you know, whether that's against women, whether that's against other religious groups, whether, you know, that is, um, in terms of saying, you know, well, my religion, but therefore you can't do it. Or I'm allowed to, you know, um, discriminate against you or treat you poorly because, you know, my magic sky friend said I could. Um, and uh, so I think that women are, as Veiled Rose pointed out, very often more of a minority in an atheist or non-believing community. And I think that's really important, too, for us to talk about how you can be a non-believing woman, woman, because too often a lot of the things that religion does well is the support system for specific big events in your life that tend to, in most of these patriarchal sanctioned religions, are women's work, you know, birth, death, marriage, illness, children. So... Um, I think it's really important to show women that you can have community, you can have support, you can have all of these things that religion claims to have a monopoly on and not be 
suffering under the yoke of their bigotry, their um, control over your life, all of those things. It's really, really important to show women that you can live well, you can have children, you can enjoy, you know, all kinds, you have support systems, things like that without having to be under the yoke of some sort of set of seventh century rules. Um, and um, like I, the last rules. thing I wanted to say um, with regard to something that um, Vail Rose said, and then also with uh, Ali said, you know, um, she taught at first, I'm going to address Ali's thing. She talked about Jehovah's Witnesses sort of being an organization. I really understand that because Judaism is a lot like that. It's a contract. And as long as you fulfill the rules of the contract, you know, you're doing what you're supposed to do. And so I really understand that. And so if you if you can look at it that that way, that because it's a contract or an organization, you can leave. Because a contracts can be broken. Organizations dissolve. I think it's it's a matter of, of sometimes reframing the way you look at the world. And then the last thing is um, I just wanted to, again, point out that it's important to me and why I'm here is to talk about this religious privilege and to stand up for women who are too often silenced. And as Veiled Rose pointed out, as Rita pointed out, sometimes just seeing someone else do it can give you the courage or the understanding that it's possible. You know, um, I very quickly just want to tell a story my mother told me as a kid. She used to listen to her um, father, grandfather, brother pray. And the first prayer a very religious Jewish man says in the morning is that he asks God to, you know, thanks God rather for not making him a woman. Women say, thank you for making me who I am. And I remember she would tell me that sometimes she felt like God didn't see her, that she was invisible. No matter how hard she tried, you know, how, how many rules she obeyed, you know, how many mitzvahs or good deeds she did, that this prayer reinforced to her this sense of invisibility. And I think that's why it's important for women to talk about this, because so often and particularly I don't know as much in Hinduism, but in the Abrahamic Trinity being, you know, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, women aren't people. Women are women, which is a separate category from a person. Yes. And that's the thing that we are constantly made to feel like we're less than, you know, and. So when you can say, you know what, no, I'm taking this off and I see all these other women who are doing it and that can empower you. And that's what's so important about all of us being here. And that's part of why I do it and why I want to speak for all these women or anyone, whether it, you know, if you're gay or if you um because that can be an issue in a lot of religions too that you feel like you're not part of something that you're less than so that's part of why i wanted to um bring that story up that my mother told me as to why i, I i'm here why i like to, to speak out thank you that's a very nice um story it's not nice as in like it's nice it's more of a like it makes you think like that's a very interesting prayer um, Ellie, how about you? What got you to become an, a more of an activist, outspoken about it? Um, so I didn't want to. Basically, when I left, I was really ashamed of having been a Jehovah's Witness because they have such horrible beliefs. And I felt really uncomfortable of who I had been. And I really embraced being able to be liberal and think and have an education. And, and I loved that. And I value that so much. And I just wanted to draw a line and just be like, that's me, that's done, that's the past, and this is now. Um, but then I realized that the main thing that was holding me back was actually, if I spoke about it, I would be branded an apostate. 
And I was really scared to be called an apostate. Uh, it was kind of a, a like a, a residual part of the belief system that I didn't want to kind of embrace that. And I, I realized that I had this big block that I really needed to get out of the way and that I had to face who I'd been and that I had this kind of insider knowledge, much the same as everyone else has said, that I realized that I knew something that other people didn't know. And I think there's such a like a misconception that Jehovah's Witnesses are just another religion. They're just this kind of nice, funny religion. These people come to your door and they they bang on it and they give you these really crap little magazines and they go away and oh, isn't that quite funny? Um, and actually, it's a really sinister religion and it's a really controlling religion and it's really misunderstood. And I think now we're like we're much more aware of islamic religions or other religions that have quite like a bad reputation in the press but jehovah's witnesses kind of just flew under the radar and um i was yeah i realized that i knew something and i was raised to believe that if i knew the truth about something then i had to speak the truth otherwise it was a sin and i thought well i've got to do something about this um and so i started writing just little bits on a blog but i was too scared to like write um because again the risk you know I, I've never been at risk of like an honor killing or anything like that I mean I I say that you obviously get rogue people but it's not something that's enshrined in in the witnesses belief system so I never ran that massive risk and I have so much respect for people who do and who you know Bale Rose you know you've shown your face that's such a big thing that was never a big thing for me but the big thing was that if I spoke out and was branded as an apostate then I knew my mother so when I started writing on my blog um my mum read it anyways and shunned me so after I was shunned well what did I have to lose then nothing so I had nothing to Can lose I, so and yeah um, Ali, uh, so I've heard the term shunning, uh, but I've not really grasped how how much it affects you as apostates from from the Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know if you if it if it's not too personal. If you could tell us a bit more about what that involved being shunned. Yeah, of course. I mean, to be honest, like nothing's too personal now because I wrote a book about it. So I feel like everything is like on the table. So don't worry about that. Um, yeah. So basically, I don't see my mum because she believes that, you know, like when you leave the witnesses, that's bad. But they I think they kind of believe that you can go back again. But once you have spoken out publicly against, well, they say Jehovah or God, but it's really if you criticize the organization, then you basically there's no hope for you. So if you die, you won't be resurrected. They believe in the resurrection. Um, so you basically you are you're basically done for. You're like beyond kind of redemption. Um, so there's a huge problem of shunning. And I think it creates a real kind of safeguarding issue as well, particularly for young people who leave, because if, say, you're 17, 18 and you've been quite a devout witness and then you leave and you know nobody outside, but your whole support network inside then shuns you, doesn't speak to you, just cuts you off overnight as well. So it's not even like you get a grace period. It's a massive problem. Um and yet, you know, you weren't aware of it. Loads of people aren't aware of it. And even on the Jehovah's Witness website, it's like, um, we don't shun. We encourage people to come back. But they use very clever language to kind of get around the fact that actually they do. They frame it as a choice. So it's that, um, you know, my mother even believes that she's chosen to shun me rather than the organization have told her to. There's so many mind games that go on. So again, I wanted people to know that that happens and kind of much like you've all said as well I wanted people to know that there is life beyond um and that life beyond is much much better and it's not you know it's not a case of I just wanted to go and be bad or I just wanted to go and be worldly like we were saying it's really a case of that there were severe doctrinal issues and there was massive issues with the religion and in good conscience and i think that's another thing that people kind of don't talk about when you're raised religiously you do tend to be kind of raised to think about your conscience and think about what's right and wrong and then when you what you're doing in that religion is actually wrong or goes against your conscience then what do you do you can't stay you've got to leave 
and there is that kind of well I need to speak out about this now as well I've got to say something so yeah I had to say something you know Ali you mentioned the shunning and um <clears throat> and so what happened with me is very similar um, my family is extremely religious to the point of being very cultish in how they adhere to the religion. And when I finally left, uh, I was also shunned overnight. And it was like a whole disowning thing. Everybody in the family stopped immediately, like either stopped talking to me or started sending me threats, one of the two. Um, or just being condescending, um, horrible people and just treating me and calling me names. But it was... What I wanted to say to everybody here is that, yeah, sure, in some cases, um, you know, like in uh, with uh, Vildrose and I being uh, from a Muslim background, it might actually affect our lives. But the biggest thing, and I don't think people here understand what it's like for a child to have their own parents, even if your child is an, if even if you're an adult child, and have your parent come to you and tell you that they do not want you in their lives anymore, it it is a crushing thing. Even if you did not have the best family growing up, it was still your family, and we wanted to have that love. We thought that love was going to be unconditional. We are their children. But to have them shun us immediately after realizing we don't adhere to their rules or believe in the same things that they believe, it's um, it, it's a trauma that really takes a lot out of you. So yeah. with other people, what I wanted to say to other people, everybody that is listening or everybody that is here, is that please don't compare your trauma to somebody else. Your trauma is as it, you know, it is it is real. You are feeling the things that you are feeling. If you do end up leaving religion and you are shunned just by your family or even shunned by a per one person, that does, it It sucks. It, it's a horrible feeling. It's traumatic to think that, you know, this person that you thought loved you unconditionally or respected you or had your back now doesn't have your back for one thing. Ali, I, I wanted to 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 say something um, with regard to something you said, which I think for me is very important, and I and I and I sense it in you as well. I ho hope I'm not wrong, but you said that when you're raised religious, you are raised to think about your conscience. You also said you were raised to speak the truth, so you felt like it. And for me, I think that that's very that aspect of it is really important. Is that you can leave these things and you can um, unfortunately even be um, shunned by your family or, you know, banished from a community. But that doesn't mean that sometimes what you were raised with is 100 percent negative in terms of how you view yourself and how you move forward in life. And the, I, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but what I'm trying to say is that. Part of who I am is because Judaism made me that way. And so it's important for me to kind of say, okay, well, what is it about those things that I can positively look at instead of feeling so negative and so um, hurt by it? And one of the things that you talked about was being raised to speak, to have a conscience, to speak your truth. Those are good things that make you who you are and give you a, a sense of self. And I, I, I try to think about it that way. I try to say, instead of like looking at my whole family experience or my whole experience with it so negatively, I try and say, well, because I don't believe that it's real, I get to pick and choose what parts mm -hmm. that I feel like helped me and reject what parts didn't. And I think sometimes that is something that can make us feel better about leaving. Like you were saying, mm -hmm. you didn't want to be an apostate. You didn't want that because it, I'm not articulating this well. I know I'm not, but somehow... Mm -hmm. Felt like I really connected with what you were saying because 
there's a level of my secularism and my work and my trying to be a light in the world that I learned from my parents, even though there were all these negatives as well. Mm-hmm. And I try and hold on to that and think, okay, you know what? People might have rejected me, but they gave me something and I'm moving forward with it in the world in my own way. And I don't know. Yeah. I just really, really, really connected to what you said when you said that. I and think I'm, sorry if I'm not articulating it. No, no, yet. I think you are. I think you're articulating it perfectly because when you leave I've had this sensation often that you feel very untethered because that part of your life is is completely contained in when I was this and because it's such a big identity as well I felt like like a literally like a thread was cut and I've had to go back and do the what parts of me from then still exist because I can't just be this person that's only 10 years old I can't just be like a decade of existing and so you have to take the positives and find the things that exist but I think also coming back to the being shunned and talking about that as a other thing that we don't have ways of talking about that grief of losing your parents or losing people who you loved and also kind of the trauma of realizing that that love was always conditional how do you square that that my mother loved me conditionally she wrote in the final email she wrote that she chose god over me and you just think wow how do you deal with that and we don't have ways of saying to other people you know i I find it really hard because I can't sort of use any cultural vernacular to explain where my mom's gone. Can't say I've lost my mom because that sounds like she's dead. So, so how do we even talk about these things? This kind of really inexplicable grief of feeling untethered from the past of kind of going, well, well, what good bits do we take forward? How do we talk about losing our parents? How do you talk about building a whole identity? And I think that's when activism is so important because it's not even about like me talking about it or you talking about it. It's, it's about so many people doing it so that people who are in the same situation don't feel alone. And I think that's kind of all I wanted at the time when I left was I just felt so alone. I just thought like I was the first person to do this and I was an awful person to do it and everything. And if I'd known that there were other people going through the same thing, it just would have made it so much easier and it would have made me not kind of go, wow, I'm such a horrific person kind of thing. Ali, your words really speak to me. I I went through the exact same thing. The last email my mother sent me was also very similar, that she chose God over me, and she will always choose God over me. And it's, um, you're right, it's a very hard thing. It always, uh, and it's something that we, um, like in psychology, when a parent is not being very nice to their child, it, it doesn't make the child hate the parent. It makes it eternalize the hate in themselves because we are brought up to think that our parents will always love us. So that if they don't love us, that means that something is wrong with us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the right thing, but that's how we rationalize it in our heads. You know, one of I'm a parent, and you're a parent, right, Allie? Yeah. Yeah. So when you, I mean, it's actually making me cry because my mother is, is not alive. And it's so sad. It makes me hurt so much because people who have parents and people who are parents to understand that they are, that that love with their child is conditional. I mean, the pain of that is so overwhelming. And I, I just had to acknowledge it for all, for all of you, because I was sitting here thinking about it and my mother is, is not living anymore. So that, that, you know, that's, easier in a sense right she's not here but to know that your parent is here and rejecting you i just really i mean i'm sending a virtual hug because i it made me cry sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you for me it's there's a lot of similarities to what you've been you guys have been saying um but there's a few differences as well uh so um i 
this is quite painful to talk about so if you just bear with um so i i talked whenever i talk to my mom about um religion so i'll i'll give her an example so i i i've over the last year i've had to cut ties with my family um completely just to keep myself sane um but the the last few times i was in touch with people like my mom i remember her saying to me oh you should pray and um and every ramadan every ramzan whenever i used to visit her it would be aren't you praying aren't you fasting and no matter how much i tell her that i don't believe in these things and i it, they're not for me she just won't listen it's a uh, it's it's on sort of like autopilot that she still asks me those things and tell me that i've got the devil inside me um and you know the sheer horror in her um that i'm not believing and i'm not praying and you know something evil is in me and i'm really evil for not doing those things um so she just won't accept it and that is really really tough and i yeah i, I think i've just had to cut my ties but one of the things that i think is really under under not talked about enough is domestic violence in our religious communities um my i i was i i, I was helping my mom escape from domestic violence and um the response because she was staying me, with me for a little while and I remember the last few days that she was with me and she was asking her friends what she should do uh, and her friends who were from the same background because she doesn't have friends outside the Muslim community they was telling her to go back to to the domestic violence situation and that was the that was the sort of like the epiphany moment when I was like I've got to get out and stay out of this community because, you know, people that I've loved most of my life, aunts and stuff like that, were saying to her, go back. And they had no sort of like qualms about it. And it just hit me. I mean, like my own siblings were sort of like giving the same sort of influences to my mother. And I was like, no, I've got to get out of this. This is this is just too much. I've got to keep myself safe, um, and and what have you. And yeah, so I I can't even imagine begin to imagine what it's like for uh, women in sort of like places like Saudi Arabia and stuff like that, where they don't where they there is no domestic violence protections and things like that um and and um if any if anything there's a public support for domestic violence it's really bizarre and hard to believe as a westerner um looking at those things but it happens you know the huge public support for domestic violence in in pakistan they the legal um part the parliament tried to pass a domestic violence bill that that made it illegal for a husband to beat his wife and the islamic clerics put a stop to it they were saying be you have to you have to take out the um wife beating bit of the bill because it's our religious right to be our wives and yeah, so I, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, but I, I think one of the things that I am really grateful for living in the UK is the secular sort of like society that I live in. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know how I would have survived without things like the welfare state and the NHS uh, and the mental health services and, and things like that. Um, and, and recourse to the police as well, because when I first left home, one of the first things I did was I went to the police to report what had happened and, and why I'd left home. And yeah, I'm just so, I, 
Yeah, I can't even imagine what it's like for people in religious countries with religious laws, um, how they they manage. And I think that's one of the reasons why people like yourself, Gada, I my my sort of like my heart goes out to you when when I hear stories like your your own. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna let I, I can see Rita's back, so I'll I'll uh, mute myself and let other people speak. I think. Can I just jump in really quickly, if that's not rude? Because I think that that's such an important point that you made, yep. Bill Rose, about domestic violence, um, in these kind of closed religious systems, and also the fact that I think that a lot of women are preconditioned not to recognize violence as well. Um, because I was in such a patriarchal religion and such a controlling religion, it was very hierarchical as well, that it was, well, you accept what God says, but you, that's filtered through the elders. So these men leading the congregation are who you have to listen to. And then you're taught that the husband is the head of the family. And so it really, when you, oh, because I didn't realize, and it was only actually when I wrote the book that I realized that it was basically coercive control on an organizational level that I was experiencing. And so it preconditioned me and preconditioned every single one of my female friends to be in bad relationships, basically. And I'm not saying that every woman who's a Jehovah's Witness is subject to coercive control from their husbands but it definitely makes you unaware of what it looks like within a system like that and I think it's actually a really really important point that you raise that you know this is something that definitely I think makes people much more vulnerable and much more susceptible to being in relationships that that they might not even recognize what's happening to them or if they do recognize the risks of leaving are too high or like you said if you try and leave there's rules and regulations in place you know I wasn't allowed to leave my husband um for anything other than sexual infidelity that's the only reason that a marriage could end and even then there was still like processes that you had to go through and you never stop to think those processes are optional I don't need to you know, go before a panel of elders. I don't need to do this because it's so deeply ingrained in you that you kind of, I equated the Wetsy's rules with the law. Like I literally thought that I had to do those things. And like Rivka says, as soon as you see it as an organization, that's when you go, hang on a second. Now I can get out because this is made up. And it was the minute I realized that this was actually all completely made up. There was no like legal obligation hanging over my head that I thought, oh well I can go now it's such a strange kind of mindset that you have to do so I think it's really vital to talk about the kind of preconditioning of women too yeah something Rivka said Rivka I just wanted to add something to you what oh you yeah said. go ahead I was wondering what was your mother actually when your mother said that she, there was no one watching her I remember my the exact moment I also stopped uh, believing when I realized that I'm doing this for my mother because she's watching over me. I'm not doing this because I'm afraid that God is going to turn me to like put me in hell because I don't even believe in God. Maybe I am one of the non-practicing Jews, but I just don't know it. Well, I just wanted to make a point about what you said about the, the coercive control and this inability to, to recognize it. If often the other people in your religious community will tell you that all of this suffering or these rules of what women can and cannot do or, you know, et cetera, or even that, that prayer, you know, thank you for not making me a woman. It's supposedly allegedly about, you know, the purity of women and the, the, the special place that women have or their ability to, you know, sort of carry the, the suffering, because particularly in um, uh, Abrahamic tradition, you know, it, God says that. That's why you have pain of childbirth, because you questioned in the Garden of Eden and you had your own thoughts and you didn't follow what you were told. So we often think that this suffering that we're going through or this pain somehow we're lied to that this makes us more godly, that this makes us 
more spiritual or moral human beings because we're absorbing all this. And, and that's sort of like the opposite of machismo, right? You know, that women have some sort of higher uh, ability to hold on to pain and that makes you a better, more believing person or a more spiritual or a more loving, whatever it is. And I think that those scriptures, if we, if we circle all the way back to what we were talking about in the beginning about learning all of these things, that sets it up for all of us in a way that it's okay to be treated like that and that you're somehow more pure if you take it. And it's absolutely coercive control because that's what abusers do. This is a good segue to the question for you, Rivka. So we have a question from Hadrian. There are school, some schools of thought in Judaism which allow for critical thinking, disbelief in God, etc. But even then they stick to rabbinical, rabbinical traditions. How do they reconcile this? If you have it. Answer this really quickly so that Rita has the chance to talk. Um, yes, there absolutely are. You know, there's there's reform Judaism, which, you know, doesn't hold a lot um, of the same rules. Um, it, for example, like, you know, mixed fabrics or a lot of reform J Jews don't keep kosher or et cetera, or, you know, they don't have the rules about menstruation and things like that. So it's, it's just um, almost like a set of like a reformation. You know, if you think about how the Catholic church went through a reformation in a way and Protestantism, then you didn't need an intercessor, you know, the priest, you could have a relationship with, you know, the deity yourself or changes, things like that. Um, there's that. There's also humanistic Judaism, which is a huge um, for, uh, school of Judaism where people say that, you know, it's not necessary to have a belief in a deity. It's about the culture. It's about the tradition. It's about the heritage. It's about the camaraderie. And I like to say, and this is sort of paraphrased from humanistic Judaism, that Judaism is about two things. It's about ancestry and it's about choice. Your ancestry can make you a Jew. Your choice to practice or not to practice, to believe or not to believe, is what makes you a religious Jew. And so you don't need both, and they're not mutually incompatible. So yeah, there are. But um, I also don't want to downplay that there are very conservative sects of Judaism that engage in the same behavior that we were talking about, the shunning, the, you know, telling your children you're dead to them, they're dead to you, um, refusing to speak to their kids, you know, physical violence, all of those things, There, those do exist. So I, I don't want to paint this rosy, rosy picture of it. Um, but in the United States, it's a little bit different um, because, we, uh, you know, we have... Um, as I said before, a large portion of American Jews that aren't believers. So yeah, the reconciliation of it isn't an issue. You know, um, people don't see it as an issue. You know, you either follow the rules or you don't, but you're still part of this tribe, I guess, you know, we would call it as far as the ancestry. But I think that it's important to, to understand that the scriptures and the prayers and all of those things, they're just as nasty, whether you want to call yourself a humanistic Jew or not. You know, they're still gross. They're still bigoted. They're still misogynistic. Um, and that requires a whole different set of sort of rewriting it to fit what works for you, which is why I brought that thing up about what Allie was saying about what she was raised to believe. So she still has this feeling of consciousness or telling the truth, but she doesn't have to hold to the, the fairy tales that, that came with it. Um, and uh, the, the last thing I wanted to say is that um, Veiled Rose was talking about the secular laws and how important those are. This is religious privilege when you have countries 
or groups of people or advocates who are saying that we need to keep this element of beating your wife. Or in the United States, you know, we've had lots of legislatures try and outlaw child marriage. And the religious people say no, you know, or, you know, all of that. That's that's religious privilege that somehow your set of beliefs, your set of prohibitions, your set of ideology has to be overlaid on everyone else. And it's we must submit to it. And it's not true. Secularism protects religious people as well. Believe what you want to believe, but don't throw a stone at me because I don't want to submit to your fairy tales or your taboos. Another thing about religious privilege is that it's it, it, nobody asks you why you're religious. But if you tell somebody who's like, yeah, I grew up Muslim, but I'm not anymore. The first question out of their mouth is why? Why not? Why do I have to always explain myself? Why, do, why is it that people that aren't religious have to explain why they left the religion, especially if it's a minority religion? Yeah, they and always put the always onus on the non-believer not the believer yeah mm -hmm. and it's also the sort of the like thinking of hierarchical systems as well that the believer is up there and you know i've had believers say well you have to respect my beliefs but there's never an idea that my disbelief will be respected as well which i always find funny it's it's not on an equal footing in any way no, we're always called disrespectful when we question things about the religion that somebody else has. Any, do you, does anyone have any questions? Uh, we have, uh, welcome back, Rita. Oh, no. Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, I really want to apologize for the inconvenience caused. I mean, my net was not working. I'm I'm so sorry, ladies. Don't yeah, please. Yeah. So actually, uh, what I want to say is that, uh, like, uh, as uh, Gara was saying, yes, we are always questioned when, uh, like, uh, when we show any any kind of like uh, disbelief to any believer. We are always questioned that why don't you believe in this? I mean, I cannot, I, 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 or uh, like, uh, I have the right to cross question, right? My real, it's it, my belief is my complete, it's, it, it, it's, 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 uh, my opinion. I have the right to keep my opinion, right? So, why, why people, if, if, if I'm religious, then uh, if you are not questioning me for being religious then why should you question me for being irreligious it's it's absolutely it's absolutely illogical and also it is unethical i believe it is unethical you need to prove that your god exists i don't need to prove that he doesn't exist right this is my point and i'm very pretty much clear about it I started asking, I started um, answering the question of why I left Islam with, why are you still Muslim? <laughs> or sometimes yeah. I would ask, I, or sometimes I would answer for the same reasons you're still Muslim. Because it's about conviction. It's, you can't, you can't just believe in something because somebody told you to believe in it. It's like um, Richard Dawkins says, we are atheists about the 4,000 gods in throughout history, but some of us have gone a step further and rejected every single one of them. Exactly. That's my answer to people a lot of times. Why don't you believe in God? I'm like, well, you know, why don't you believe in all exactly what Vail Rose was saying? You know, I'm just taking it one step further. And the other thing, um, to your point, uh, Rada, was when people say, well, what if you're wrong? And you say, well, what if you're wrong? You know, and all of those kind of things for me, I find are a distraction because I, I like to say to people, I'm not concerned what happened before. 
I was born or what's going to happen after I die. What's important to me is what I do here. Now. This you know? all concept of God and religion is man-made. This mm -hmm. all, everything is man-made. And this has been created by all, uh, by people who want to rule over us and who want to like divide us. So mm -hmm. this is absolutely this this whole concept of God, religion, and everything is absolutely baseless for me. You need to prove the existence of God. You need to prove that there is something supernatural that controls the world. Unless you are able to prove the uh, prove the existence of god how can you ask someone to believe in god that that's ir that's absolutely illogical and i agree i mean it's also uh, i believe it's pretty arrogant to say that we have all of the answers um one of the biggest questions believers ask us non-believers is um you know but you know, how did you come to this world you know what's keeping the world going the way it is um how what's going to be after death how do you explain miracles and to them when we say i don't know it's considered uh like a weakness i don't find it as a weakness i find it humbling when somebody says i don't know and um and i don't know how how it is how do you how you ladies feel but to me it's actually comforting i am not at all bothered by not knowing what the answers <laughs> are how do you guys feel I am completely with you and I like I was nodding emphatically I think it's so much more humble just to say I don't know I don't have the answers like when I was like seven I would go knocking on people's doors and say have you ever thought what happens after death and I was a really judgmental annoying know-it-all horrible little child and I was as an adult too and I'm just not willing to be that person I like being able to say, no, I don't know. And I think it makes you a better person for want of a better word. I think it makes you a more curious person as well because when you don't have the answers, you go out and you think about it. You think about what it means to be human and you think about what makes other people human and finding that shared humanity instead of a shared belief that's been fed to you as well. And I think it's really important for everyone to go and figure out like what their own morals are and where you sit on the fence about things rather than being told where you sit because it does not make you a better person just to not do something because you think you won't go to heaven or you'll go to hell or whatever belief system you subscribe to. That's not making you better, that's just making you afraid. Well, if someone asks I think me cause... that what is... Yeah, yeah, please go on. No, go ahead, Rita. Yeah, actually, oh, well, if someone go ahead, Rita. You have been on for very long. Uh, yeah, if someone asks me that, uh, like, what, or uh, what is after your death, like, or, or like, what, or what is, what about afterlife? I would answer that, uh, like, no one has seen afterlife, right? Even the if the even when the believers die, like, uh, the, is there any guarantee that they are going to heaven? No. So, I mean, if something doesn't have any proof, why would I believe that? Why would I have faith in that? That's my question. And that is still unanswered by the theists. If any theist is able to answer this question, I promise that I'll start believing in, in God. I promise. But you have to answer this question: What is what is afterlife? And if you uh, like, have you experienced afterlife? Have you been in touch with someone who is already dead? Don't ask that question. You will find people that say, "Yes, yes. I do actually talk to the dead on a regular basis." This is, they call themselves mediums. Is, then, 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 then that person is a complete oh. fraud. Let me tell you, that person is a fraud. <laughs> Well, by well, I find that, <laughs> that person is a fraud. <laughs> For me, some well, I find the most have any proof. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, please continue. All right. Um, oh, well, let's uh, let's have some closing remarks before we end. Um, yes, let's go ahead with Vale Rose. I was going to just add to what we, we were just talking about. One thing that I find most infuriating is that this, this is the only existence that we know we have for sure you know the life we have now and it is short and why people waste it or gamble it gamble on it by following these religious rules with these empty promises of 72 virgins or whatever is beyond me and it is really tragic because we're not gonna once we're dead we're more than likely just dead um and yeah, to waste what little precious life we have is just really sad to me. Um, yeah. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here with us. This was a great discussion. Uh, before we end, I'd like to have uh, everybody here just give some closing remarks. Um, let's start with Rita. Yeah, I want to uh, end this, uh, end my uh, show with a question, uh, an open question to the thesis. I mean, what makes you believe in God? Have you seen God, or have you experienced God? And if you if you say that you have experienced God, what is your experience? What is your experience? If you're saying, if you're telling me that uh, like uh, your uh, sick, your cancer patient father got cured, he got cured because of a doctor, not for any, any kind of supernatural belief or anything. You need to prove me that uh, God exists. If you are able to prove that God, God exists, I'll start believing or else. <laughs> Please let me live with, with my with my belief, and please don't question why I am an atheist. And also, my uh, uh, my uh, request to Hindu women who are in a dilemma: please be brave, and please have the guts to leave your religion, or or else please have the guts to question anything if you if you find anything illogical. That's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rita. Uh, Rivka? Okay, so my final uh, thoughts is I thank every, all of the, you for being here with me. Um, it was a great discussion. I'm really honored and privileged that I was able to participate. And I, I just want to say the, the final thing is that, you know, I, I hope that in some way we can learn how to, um, you know, live in a way that allows other people to believe or disbelieve as they want, but also the idea that freedom of thought is an essential fundamental human right. It's the, the quintessential one. It allows us to have everything else. If you can't say what you think, you can't do anything else. And so, like liberty, freedom from arbitrary authority, all of those things, those are values that most people, and this is to quote um, a friend of mine, are more moral or ethical than the scriptures they believe in. A lot of people actually do believe in those things. And so if we can work towards like a, a society where those things are valued in people, um, that that's kind of what why I, I wanted to be here, as I said before, and why I keep doing what I do and why I try to reach out to other non-believers, but even believers, you know, um, just to let them know that, you know, if you can champion a world where people are liberated from, you know, seventh century thought, liberated from religious privilege. It limits the choices in thought and rights and civil liberties. But at the same time, you can, um, if you can work for that, that that's my goal. That's what I, I'm trying to do. You know, I try to um, also tell people who are believers, you know, a secular world protects you as well. 
So we don't have to always be at odds. You know, we, we can, we can, um, we can try to bring light in this world. And that's what I'm trying to do and why I'm here. Thank you, Ripka. That was nice. That was beautiful. Ali? I think just coming back to something that Rivka said as well um, about faith and faith by definition is the assured expectation of things not yet beheld. And I think that that means that faith is a kind of delusion of its own. If you can believe in something that you can't see, you can believe in something that you don't know will happen for sure. Um, and I want to believe in things that I know to be true and things that I know to be real and things that I've chosen to believe in. And I think that coming back to the idea of light as well, it helps you find the light in the world and it helps you be the light in the world, even just like on a small day-to-day -day level, instead of judging people and telling people why they're wrong and pointing out the differences in people, it helps you find the shared similarities, um, which is why I do what I do. I don't write that much about having been a witness anymore. I write different things. Um, but in everything that I do write, I hope to kind of try and examine what it is to be human. Um, and I think that that's kind of what's come through with all of us talking here today. And it's been it's been lovely. It's been such a privilege. Thank you so much um, for having me. And it's been lovely to talk to all of you as well. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Bale Bros, do you have the last? Is it all right? Yes, please. Sorry, I got confused earlier. So uh, I do apologize. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, all I can say is that I am benefiting from the Faithless Hijabi and mental health program greatly. I'm in therapy with them through them at the moment, and it is really life changing and it is really helpful. So um, please donate and share this live and um please everybody stay in touch with each other we've got to build a community um because we've left a community behind and we've got to build our own community and you know i i know i've benefited from building my own community and my own family um since i've left religion so i'm hoping to be a inspiration is probably a bit too grandiose a word but i'm hoping that i'm encouraging other people to seek their own families and their own communities and healthy ones with healthy boundaries uh, and lots of love and and things like that and there's no nothing wrong with being wrong so you know we all go through our own journeys and sometimes we make mistakes and sometimes um we get things right uh, but it's about still going through that journey regardless and daring to be ourselves uh, it's just so important um and yeah i just want to thank everybody on the panel for being here and um sharing our experiences together and there's so many similarities it's unbelievable it's um religions are literally what haram doodle says uh, man baby cults you know if you read read the texts and stuff like that all of these religions sound like some hissy fit man baby has come along and said this is how i want things to be and we've all got to follow suit so but at the end of the day i'm waffling so i'm sorry but yeah please 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 uh, donate and share and be a part of the community and know that you're not alone and there are people who want to support you and um yeah that that's it thank you thank you everyone thank you veiled rose ali rita and rivka you have been absolutely amazing Thank you everybody for watching and listening and asking questions and uh, commenting and being all engaged. Uh, this has been, uh, I'm very, I'm very grateful to be able to do the, to host this panel. I'm, and I'm very, very grateful to Faithless Hijabi for doing what, um, when I first became an ex-Muslim, I really wish that something like this existed to help um, and other ex-Muslims just, you know, come to terms with uh, such a very huge, drastic, essentially life-changing experience. And I don't know if it's the same for everybody else, but if you, for example, grew up in a very Muslim 
country, it would be the only thing you see. And then you you sometimes feel like you don't fit in. You feel like something is wrong with you. If you have any of these um, uh, thoughts and feelings that put you down, uh, you know, uh, consider therapy, consider reaching out to us. Uh, if you don't, or even if you do, you know, if, please donate to Faithless Hijabi. We are doing some really good work. Uh, some, you know, it's it's very helpful to have somebody to talk to that understands the the, the trauma, the religion, and even just the, the things that you have to go through on a daily basis. Uh, so thank you, everybody, again. Uh, thank you so much for being here, and um, uh, we'll see you next time. Keep uh, follow us on Instagram and Facebook, and I believe Twitter or X uh, at Faithless Hijabi, and uh, visit our website and donate. Thank you, everybody. I'm Khadija, and I've been living a double life for three years. I'm not a spy. I'm a woman of faith at home and a non-believer when I'm out. I started questioning my faith a while ago. I told my family about it, and it did not go well. I was lost and alone. I did not know who to turn to. Then I found out about Faithless Hijabi's mental health program. Therapy helped me process and overcome challenges, including fear and isolation of living in a closeted life and navigating relationships. Faithless Hijabi provides a supportive community for young people who have left the faith, along with access to mental health services and resources. But they need your help to continue their important work. Please consider donating to Faithless Hijabi and help make a difference in the lives of these young people. Together, we can provide them with the support they need to heal and thrive. All right.